I am very happy to be speaking to a man whose name is very well known in radio, Purdy. This is Brian Purdy. Hello. Hi. Of course, I was also referring to your father with the well-known name, Ray Purdy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about him? My dad was born in London, England in 1910 and came to Canada at three years old. Uh, his original name was Horatio because his mother favored the exciting stories of Horatio Hornblower. And years later, uh, he changed it to Ray, R-A-I. And uh, in his um, uh, sort of late teen, early 20 years, um, he did a lot of work at Hart House in Toronto in plays and directing. And um, he uh, acted quite a bit there. Radio was just kind of starting out in Toronto. And uh, he was in charge and a director in a, a group called the Dickens Fellowship. And they did a lot of Charles Dickens plays at Hart House. And there was kind of a community in Toronto uh, back in those days. And I guess that would be, oh, perhaps late 20s, early 30s. And it was kind of an acting community that got together and did things together and met and so forth. The Arts and Letters Club was just starting at that time. And it was kind of a, a creative, artistic expression that was cooking away. Uh, my dad's sister owned the, the biggest costume company in Toronto before Malabar's ever started. And she used to do the uh, Santa Claus parade for the Eaton store back then. And um, so he was um, working away doing those uh, kind of things in drama. And then uh, um, he went to Harry Sedgwick at CFRB on Bloor Street and got a job as a, a staff announcer there. At, uh, I think it was about 25 bucks a week, which was pretty good in those days. And um, worked his way up and, and really uh, was probably one of the pioneers in radio. There weren't that many outlets um, back in those days. And CFRB was up and coming and, and did a lot of things on a, a kind of network basis. And uh, he originated a lot of shows uh, as a producer and a writer and an actor, uh, which was kind of a nice cross section. He was that kind of a man that just uh, was involved in everything. And uh, I could rattle off some names here. He uh, did a lot of drama series. He was kind of the Hitchcock of radio. Uh, he was quoted by Gordon in one of Gordon Sinclair's columns once. And he had a show called um, Out of the Night. And it was sort of like an inner sanctum. And it was creepy, crawly shows. And he did all the voices on it. And I still have some audio tapes of some of them, which is kind of fun to listen to. And he kind of became a, a household name in Canada over the years. He uh, then started doing some army shows. He had one called George's Wife. Uh, and Penny's Diary, and a show called Flying for Freedom, um, which NBC used in the States. It was one of the very few Canadian radio shows that they used. In Soldier's Wife, Ruth Springford played the lead in it way back then. Um, so he was really, uh, he became um, uh, really drama director of programming at CFRB in those days when radio did that kind of thing, and they had orchestras playing and so forth and so on. And CFRB had an auditorium, and um, the public could come and sit in on radio shows and watch all the things happening and the sound effects taking place and laugh and cheer and applause, much like they do on uh, television shows now. And um, so he created a lot of shows and uh, hosted them. Uh, he first got into um, really finding talent in Canada, and he had a show called Stars to Be, invite them on to sing and do various things like that. One of his big shows, which was sponsored in those days, uh, the sponsors would take the whole show on, and it was called the Canadian Cavalcade. And it had talent and singers on, and it was sponsored by Bordens through uh, Young and Rubicam at that time. And uh, Lauren Green was the MC on it, and they brought in talent and uh, from all over the province, and I guess Canada as well. And he did another show called The Wrigley Show, which was Wrigley's Gum. And it was a talent show as well. Wally Coster was a singer on it. And uh, Alice McClintock was the orchestra leader with the CFRB band, I guess, something like that. And um, Monty Hall hosted it. And my dad kind of discovered Monty Hall in, in uh, Winnipeg. And I met Monty Hall a couple of years ago at the Variety Club. And he said, Brian, 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 uh, your dad started me in programming in Toronto. He brought me to Toronto. I was making about 25 bucks a month. He brought me to Toronto, and I made... 50 bucks a week doing two game shows with him, hosting them and so forth. And he says, that's really how I got going in the game show business. And it was kind of fun to sort of go back in that, that era with him. And uh, another show he did was called Treasure Trail. And he was kind of the, the leader in, 
in-game shows, and now they're very big, of course, these days with Who Wants to uh, Be a Millionaire, and he hosted, co-hosted that with Alan Savage. He had another show sponsored by Ogilvy uh, in 1948 called Find Your Fortune, and that was co-hosted with Monty Hall, and they had some good times, and the audience came and packed them and had good laughs and so forth. And another fun show he did was called Double or Nothing, kind of a game thing where I guess you answered questions and did it or you didn't do it. He did a lot of series of shows for the Department of Health and Welfare. And back in those days, and I remember going as a young boy, uh, there was a radio recording studio at the top of the roof of the Royal York Hotel, fully equipped and everything. And uh, he did a series A with Herb May and Cy Mack and Monty Hall. And I was fascinated uh, watching this being recorded on a wax disc as they cued and everybody was quiet and they did the script and so forth. And then over in the corner was a fellow with the sound effects and the door opening and closing and the clip-clop of walking and so forth, all the cues. That was very adventuresome and I really enjoyed that. And uh, so he kind of progressed through those, uh, those days of radio and uh, then when the, um, uh, the war came along he was... Uh, uh, given a um, commission as captain in the army and he did uh, all of the army shows over in England for the troops and Jimmy Shields was in his group and Wayne and Schuster who in those days were called Schuster and Wayne and I even have some sheet music of some musical pro programs they wrote for the army shows and he produced quite a few uh, army shows in those days and that is kind of the the radio broadcast career he does go on to television I can into that if you like. Um, at the end of the, uh, the war there was quite a, a, a problem and it took a lot of time to get the troops back to Canada. So he went to his uh, general and uh, got the funds to produce a major rodeo show in a place called Aldershot in England um, to keep the troops happy while they waited for the, the ships to go back and forth and back and forth. And he rounded up horses from all over the place. And I remember a few years ago they wrote to him and asked him to send some material to them because they're starting a little museum there which I'd love to visit someday. So he produced that. Came back to Toronto and he had a studio downtown on Queen Street um, called Purdy Productions and radio was changing then. Television was just sneaking in at that point. It was kind of the early 50s and he wasn't able to do the same kind of packaging as he used to do. So he took the big step and went down to New York where television was starting. Took him about a year <clears throat> but he finally got a job, and he took over directing some program that was at that time being directed by Yul Brynner. And Yul Brynner had just moved out of CBS to start his stage career. And uh, my dad started directing for CBS uh, just prior to them going union. And I remember him telling me when they went union, his uh, salary went four times what it, it was originally. But he did a show with Mike Wallace called All Around the Town. And uh, he took the first television camera up the Empire State Building and the first television camera up the Statue of Liberty and uh, did a show from the Stork Club. And they created a studio upstairs above the dining room that was a duplicate of the Stork Club down below because of the hot lights in those days. It was black and white, live to air. And uh, so he worked there for quite a while and um, did a few things. And um, he... Uh, uh, progressed as a director. I, I remember finding some scripts in the early days uh, and he uh, was assigned to teach cameramen how to move cameras and dolly and so forth and so on and create the terms and he had this thing blocked out and I guess the new people who were applying for jobs since there were no schools in those days uh, had to be taught how to handle cameras and in those days you had lenses, lenses that you racked over all the time uh, rather than the zoom lenses that are used today so that was kind of fun to come across that and um, the, uh, he then, uh, uh, Roy Thompson got in touch with him and uh, uh, he made a deal to start Scottish television in Glasgow for Roy Thompson. And that's where Roy made his really big money in those days to buy himself his, his lordship at those, that point. I remember my dad telling me that the first year that they were on the air, because it was the second channel in Great Britain, he made something like a million pounds profit. And he came to my dad at Christmas and gave him a box of candy chocolates as a Christmas <laughs> gift. <laughs> that was sort of typical of Roy Thompson. <laughs> and some lovely stories. He called my dad one day out of his office uh, and said, come down the street. There's an antique store. I want to show you something. And so they all trudged down. And there was this very old barber's chair sitting there. And he said, uh, I can get this for three bob. Do you think we could use it? And 
in the uh, makeup department. <laughs> so he took one of his executives all the way out of his office to buy this this chair, but that was what he was like. And uh, so my dad was probably one of the few people to make a good salary from Roy Thompson. And then Thompson was part of the original group that made the application for the first TV license um, in Toronto. There were nine applicants at that time, and uh, that was the group of John Bassett and Foster Hewitt and Joel Aldred and uh, Ted Rogers. And uh, at that time, Roy Thompson was part of the group as a sort of broadcaster slash publisher. And uh, he loaned my dad to John Bassett to design and uh, make the application to the BBG, the Board of Broadcast Governors at that point, and uh, brought him over from Scotland and set him up here in a house in Rosedale and uh, worked for six or eight months to package this application. Partway through it, the BBG suggested that Roy Thompson drop out of the application because of his heavy interests in newspapers and that that would probably be a conflict with giving out the, the license. It was a very hot time then, and I remember attending the hearings, and uh, uh, they were held at the um, uh, Union Station in a room called the Oak Room uh, with the BBG there, and it was packed all the time. And I was uh, a young stagehand at CBC and arranged my shifts so I could be there to watch this action. Very exciting. CBC was the only game in town across Canada at that point, and here were these nine applicants with all of their, their big backers and so forth and so on. And uh, some people were using flip charts, some people were using slides, and my dad talked uh, Joel Aldred and John Bassett into spending some money and making their presentation on videotape. But this was the business they were going to be in. They were going to show some samples of shows they were going to do, a monthly show with the TSE. Um, my dad created a show called uh, Call Emergency, which was based on ambulances running around and the two drivers. Well, that was even before Adam-12 was created and all of those kind of programs. Um, so they packaged quite a show in the middle of the summer in a very hot studio in preparation for the hearings. And there was only one place in town that was a private production studio in those days, and they brought their truck down to Union Station. And uh, partway through their presentation to the BBG, they uh, ran the tape, and all the fuses blew, and the whole place went black. Nobody had tested out this powerful truck. And uh, I believe my dad was at the podium at the time, and being the actor and packaging all of the uh, program. He just kept talking through the dark till I fixed the fuses. And anyway, they got the license. And that was very exciting. Um, my dad became first program director at CFTO. And uh, uh, we started packaging out in Kleinberg prior to 1960 while they were building the studios. And it was kind of fun. I was um, hired as a floor manager and we started producing pre-packaging shows at Kleinberg and were able to look at the blueprints and see what was happening at the studio and all of this business before it went on air. And then the big day of it going on air and they flew in all kinds of personalities. I remember Barbara Hamilton coming in by helicopter. In those days, Agent Court was a million miles from downtown Toronto. And they went on air with seconds to go before cameras were actually turned on. There was all kinds of technical hitches. And they did a telethon. Uh, which ran, I think, for about 24 hours. And that was one of the first Canadian tele telethons in Canada. And my dad went on to produce some in later years as a business. And it was very exciting and um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in the mix of things uh, in those days. A, a real high to be working with a new company, a multi-million dollar company that was just starting up with new premises. It was open season for programming. Uh, Ryerson was just a little studio. They had ex-CBC people teaching there. So you were really learning while you are on the air. And um, it was really, a lot of it was live television, creating shows and getting sponsors and making it work and uh, paying back all the, the big money that had been invested into the studio. And after about a year, my, my dad decided uh, he was having a bit of a conflict with uh, Joe Waldred and went to John Bassett and said, uh, John, you've got to get rid of this guy. You're going to go bankrupt. And Aldred had brought in uh, some of his heavies from California um, studios, uh, his head of uh, set design, his controller, um, and uh, head of videotape, and they were pretty heavy salaries in those days. My dad left and went out west to start his own company, and shortly after that, that's what happened. Uh, Bassett did buy out Joel Aldred, who had, I think, about 30 percent of the shares, which even in those days was a lot of money, a lot of financing, and that may have been where the, the Eaton money came into the CFTO package. And I was there as a floor director from day one. And uh, after the first year, there was kind of a, 
there were two factions going on, the Murray Cherkover faction and the Joel Aldred faction. My dad had hired Murray Cherkover from CBC, who was doing commercials in those days, uh, to be his, his, his assistant vice president. And uh, Murray took over then as program director, and Joel left. And, and I stayed on, was promoted to a director, and went on to some fun things. That's another story. My dad went out west, and uh, he started programming in uh, British Columbia. And for about seven years, he did a show called People in Conflict, five days a week that was on CTV Network. That was quite exciting, the James Beard cooking show. And then he started a show called Magistrate's Court, which was one of the, the very early, it might have just been after the Perry Mason series, a courtroom type thing. And he got into the um, uh, telethon business and did telethons for years and years, raising millions of dollars for everybody from the Lions Clubs to... I remember one exciting time, we packaged one in Toronto, um, and it was for, um, I can't remember who it was, but we did that show together, which was quite exciting, and uh, one of the last telethons he did. So he was really a pioneer through the 20s, 30s, right up to, he did make the transition from radio to television. A lot of people didn't. I remember in the early, late 50s, when I was a stagehand at CBC, they were drawing from stage directors and English directors in those days, because there was no place else to go. Some of them made it, some of them didn't. They couldn't handle the technology, the cutting of cameras, especially when it was live to air, live to tape, it was just too much. But he made that transition, and um, I think probably the, the environment of CBS in New York helped, and then developing a whole uh, station in Scotland was kind of nice. And I remember um, when Scottish TV had their 25th anniversary, they flew my dad and his wife back from Vancouver all the way to Scotland, and I have a, a tape of that interview. It was really exciting to bring him back as one of the founders of the, the station. And uh, so it was a, a, a lovely career, and uh, he certainly contributed to the development of broadcasting in Canada. Oh, he certainly So that's a short did. answer. Very interesting. <laughs> I thank you for all that. Oh, I'll right. get back to you. Okay. Now, Brian Purdy. When did your career start, and where? Uh, in Toronto? Yes, I was born here. <coughs> I graduated from Pickering College up in Newmarket <coughs> and uh, had a job at de Havilland, uh, stamping papers. And I'd applied at CBC. Uh, I'd had a lead and applied. And if you had anything to do with theater, you could get a job. It was expanding very quickly. Uh, it, it was an incredible production source. Things were happening all the time. That would be in the 50s? That was in about the mid-50s, I believe. Second year they were on the air. And uh, I'd worked in some amateur theater in Toronto, a group called the York Community Players. And I found I was good at, at the technical end of things, doing sound effects, lighting cues, occasional walk-on parts, and so forth. And I enjoyed that, so that was the only real background I had in theater. So they hired me as a stagehand because I knew which end of a hammer was up. And actually, I was a truck driver at the time. And a few weeks later, I got promoted to a stagehand. And here I am. I walked into Studio 4, and I think it was a Jackie Ray show was in rehearsal. And uh, music and lights and action and cameras and dancing girls. And I said, I love this, and I'm being paid for it. This is going to be my business. And uh, it was exciting because uh, in, I guess, 56 and 57, it was live to air. And you had to go by strict schedules and rehearsals and breaks and so forth and so on. I remember uh, there was a time um, I was working in the Fly Gallery at uh, Studio 4 in Toronto on Young Street, and Norman Jewison was directing at that time. He hadn't gone to New York yet. And it was very exciting for me because I was able to wear a set of earphones because uh, I had to cue sets in and out in the fly lines. And I could hear what he was doing, his instructions to the cameraman, why he stopped rehearsal, why he moved things around, the directions he gave to his floor manager. And so I liked that job up there, and I, I would try and get that when I could. Um, the, you never knew what shift you were going to get on. One day you might be on a drama assigned for two or three days. The next it might be uh, the news with Percy Saltzman. Uh, the next time it might be an opera. Uh, any number of things. Uh, it was happening all the time, and I didn't really re realize what was happening around me, but it was, uh, it was very exciting. Uh, people were energetic then. There were new faces all the time coming in. It was growing and growing and growing. The studios were expanding. Um, they finally did go to videotape, but it was called convenience recording, where they'd record straight to tape, so it was as if it was live. And uh, I loved Wayne and Schuster. Um, I ended up being one of the few permanent stagehands on Wayne and Schuster for about four years. 
because I had a music background. And if they had to make a chandelier swing to the beat of the music, I could do it with the pulley lines and so forth. And um, that was great fun. They were adventurous. Um, and you'd work with them in the rehearsal halls and then join them in the studios. They were big budget. They had good music on it, uh, a lot of talent, and um, watching them grow and mature. I remember Don Hudson was one of their directors at one point, and there was lots of yelling matches on the floor and so forth and so on, but that was the nature of that show. Sometimes the dress rehearsals were a lot funnier than what went on air because they were a little, uh, a little looser, I guess, and a little more relaxed. And um, so those were good days, and then I applied to CFTO as a floor manager when it just started, and I got in there and after a year became a director. Did all kinds of things, shows where you'd have a panel of five people and only have two cameras, so you'd have to use your wits about how you could crisscross and rack lenses and so forth and so on. Uh, inventing shows, carrying them through, and then I got assigned to a lot of daytime work where I did um, TV bingo for a number of years, and um, then got into some news. I was around when the first time Harvey Kirk went on the air, because I was doing news in those days. And um, went up the ladder and did some country western shows. And I guess the prime of my career at CFTO was two years as a producer and director of a show called It's Happening with Robbie Lane and the Disciples. It was probably the forerunner of music videos. It was a Thursday night primetime music show, very popular, sponsored by DuPont. And we did 12 production numbers in each show, singers, dancers. In the summer time, we'd uh, audition in uh, Montreal and Ottawa for Canadian talent, bring them in during the season. And I used to tape two one-hour shows, no, I'm sorry, they're half-hour shows, every other Friday. And that's just not done anymore. Um, and we'd have 12 production numbers, it'd be 24 production numbers, live audience, and it was exciting, exhilarating, creative. Uh, you're trying to do things uh, uh, chroma key, had just come in at the time, so you could put people in, in backgrounds and make things happen. So I was just a young kid with new toys playing around and having a great time with pop music and all these, these Canadian stars coming up the ladder. After I left CFTO, uh, I got into an advertising agency as a producer director because I'd had a lot of years of experience in videotape and it was just coming into the agency business. Uh, tape was a little bit cheaper. I'd done the first videotape animation in Canada only because CFTO had color equipment and uh, was into that business. They trans did the transition about the late 60s to color, so I was one of the first to use their color studio for It's Happening with four cameras and a crane and oh boy it was super seeing it all in color. And uh, so I joined an agency as a producer for four years at uh, Baker Lovick. That grew quite well, did a lot of production there. And then I moved to Ronald's Reynolds as a senior producer. And they had a lot of large national accounts. So I was going to New York to do music tracks and Los Angeles to do effects. Things hadn't been developed in Toronto at that point. People hadn't invested money in the technical techniques and so forth. And I picked up a lot of awards from that point and broke out on my own around 1980 as a producer director. Did a lot of corporate videos, sales training type things. I was commissioned by Foster Advertising to do the time-lapse photography of the building of Sky Dome in Toronto, which took about two and a half years. And we locked off a camera in a condominium just south of the CN Tower and shot this thing for two and a half years and strung it together. And it took about two and a half minutes to watch it, so we called it two and a half years and two and a half minutes. And I picked up four or five awards in the States and a couple in Canada, and then I got a Gemini for it in 1990 for technical excellence beating out a CBC submission and an NFB submission. So for a guy who had a uh, really, um, for the Gemini, not to have a script or a cast or those usual things, <laughs> or an orchestra to win a Gemini, that was kind of fun. So that's been sort of the range of my career. My son has gone on to be a stagehand uh, with IATSE, he has his card as of last year, and does a lot of rigging uh, with the feature films that are being here. So we're now into the the third generation, if you like. So. A party, okay, yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah. Did you always want to be in some form of entertainment? Well, I think so. I, I remember back as a youngster in school being in school plays, mm -hmm. and that's usually the start where you, you sneak off. I was just looking at uh, biography last night of Les Leslie Nielsen and his kind of early career, and I remember holding cue cards for him. At CBC, but and and then I think getting into uh, the amateur theater sort of stirs you a bit, and if you 
catch that fire, you, it's there. You like the environment, you like the, the, the discipline that's involved in it, the excitement, uh, the live audience, the opening night, the closing night, all of that affection that goes with the business. And I've been very lucky that uh, kind of business is not here anymore. And I think having grown up with that through that era of the 50s, 60s, 70s, I've been very blessed about having that. It's a different business entirely now. It really is. Yes, yeah. I'm afraid so. <laughs> Did you ever have to take a civilian job to further what you wanted to do? Well, uh, because I'd done a lot of computer animation, I was approached to um, do an electronic billboard on the Gardner Expressway, which was the light bulbs which tell you oh, yeah. to buy things and so forth. And that was kind of a second job in the old days, and it is now my main core of living at this point, because broadcasting has changed. And I do color billboards in Toronto and Montreal and Don Valley Parkway. And again, it's communicating. It's using typeface pictures, editing. And uh, that is growing quite a bit now into the net and all of those technical things, which I've sort of grown with the technology as, as it's progressed over the years. That's great. It's not yeah. really a civilian job then. It's not it's really. It's, it's a spin-off a little bit. Public, yeah. yeah. Which is what theater is all about. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there anything you would have liked to do, but it just didn't happen? Um, one thing I attempted that I wish I could have done for television, uh, I produced, I was trying to show off a little bit in the late mm -hmm. 50s so I could become a director. And I got together a group and I produced a Franz Lehar operetta that he wrote before The Merry Widow called, called The Count of Luxembourg. And I got a... Uh, um, a script that was not in a, some language, uh, and a Hungarian group translated it to English, uh, got in touch for the music rights out of New York and his nephew or something out of Montreal for the rights. And I staged this at the um, uh, theater at the, um, I guess it was the Eaton Auditorium at uh, College and Young Street. Cast of 35, three sets. I was a young stagehand, you know, making about 2,200 bucks a year. Um, and I uh, got a director and uh, had a 16-piece orchestra. And it ran for two nights before it folded. But I got it up and launched it, and I had some press on it and so forth. It was lovely. Um, it was some of the, the people that sang had beautiful voices, couldn't speak English, so I had to sing phonetically the words. And I'd always wanted to take that one to television because it's, it's a beautiful story. It's yeah. got love and some lovely, lovely music. And that, that's one thing I would have liked to have done. Well, you'd have to have uh, backers, I suppose. To, uh, yes, and I'm not sure that the market would take it these days, although with the A&Es and so forth, yeah. yeah I'm no. interested in that, yeah. and uh, public broadcasting. Yes. And, uh, um, I was part of some of the hearings in Ottawa back when cable came in, and then I uh, was part of working with Global when they were making their application for the Seniors Channel a few years ago. Went down to Ottawa and made a six-minute positive um, intervention to the CRTC about why there was a market for it, why it was needed, and backing up the, the global application and so forth. And we had a company set up, and we were going to do a seniors game show, travel show, which is kind of a natural, and a couple of other things. Global got the license, changed the people we were working with. It's now called Prime Television, and basically it's reruns of old shows, so they haven't really done a market for that. There is a place for it, I think, and uh, sometime it will come about. And I'd like to be there when that happens. Make it happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's room now. Yeah. Yeah. Just go after it. Yeah. You ever had to work with somebody you didn't agree with? Say, uh, producer, you've got a director mm -hmm. on the floor, and you simply don't agree with mm -hmm. what you think he should be. Has that ever happened? I can't remember a specific time. You're lucky. Um, I'm very lucky. <laughs> uh, a lot of the times I produced and directed myself. Yeah. I've tried to know people as well as I can, and maybe because I've used all of the tools of the business, uh, like an orchestra leader, you can mm -hmm. kind of know which part goes where kind of thing. Uh, and you have to sort of say to yourself, you don't always get it your own way. You've got to be a bit flexible with whoever you've hired. Yeah. Right. Because I'm sure he thinks his way is right. Mm -hmm. and yes, and, and you know I, I appreciate <laughs> points of view. Right. Yeah. What do you do? You just go along with it? Um, sometimes I can steer it a little bit, ask for another version perhaps. Uh, it's important that it gets done the way it should be done. Mm -hmm. 
and hopefully the person I've hired to do that particular job I've trusted to be in sync with and yeah. have the same way of thoughts. Then you're lucky. Yes, I am. <laughs> you ever work with somebody you didn't like? Uh, or just don't, you don't hire that person? Yeah, I, not that I, I can remember, no. I, I've been very fortunate that way in working with people that have been above me or below me. And uh, so I've enjoyed that. I can say it's been good and quite rewarding, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You really are lucky. <laughs> if you hadn't chosen entertainment, mm -hmm. what other profession might have interested you? Well, I've always thought that uh, if I'd had a second career, it might have been as a lawyer. I'm very detailed. Um, I'm very organized and so forth and so on. And I think that would have been a challenge to me. Yeah. Do you think you would have enjoyed that? I think so. I, I think the challenges of the, the different things that have come up, and that's not unlike programming. Um, everything in, in law and dealing with people, in a sense, is, has a kind of a script to it, and a, a beginning and an ending. And uh, I just think I would have liked that as a, as a career, as a you second know, career. Still I can still do that. Get your degree <laughs> that's right. <laughs> off you go. Yes. What have you done that, that gave you the most pleasure? I really like broadcasting. Um, I miss it. Uh, it's different when you're doing corporate videos and training things. It's different than doing a show that's on air. I loved being at home, turning on the, the set on Thursday night and watching my shows. And they reran them in the summertime, of course. We did 36 half hours in those days for CTV. Uh, and, oh, I remember that shot. Oh, I remember that person. Yeah. Uh, gee, that was kind of clever. I forgot that. There was a reward of that, just like driving on the Gardner Expressway and seeing my signs up there saying, oh, that's working. <laughs> oh, they got that plugged in today, you know? And uh, uh, so I think the It's Happening show with Robbie Lane was very exciting because it was creative. And with the ultimate background, I could have the dancers dancing on a shoulder, for instance, shrink them down over here and do that. I was able to do everything. They just let me go at it. And that was kind of fun. And. Uh, um, I used to watch everything, the Jackie Gleasons, and even back in radio days, my sister and I would sit in front of the radio and listen to radio programs, the Jack Benny's and the Green Hornet and so forth, and that's where some of the drama started. Every Saturday afternoon was to the theater to see movies, um, and uh, I hung out with a group of kids, and if it was a, a cowboy movie, we'd play cowboys for the balance of the afternoon. If it was a pirate movie, we'd play pirates for the balance of the afternoon. So in a sense, I was directing a little bit in those days too yeah. because I had all of the the swords and the the toy guns and stuff and hand them out and tell people the roles and when I think back at it that was kind of a, a directing uh, when you approach. compare radio and television acting which do you think is the more what's the word I'm looking for not difficult but uh, which is harder <laughs> to do radio or television, in your opinion? I think there's a, a great sensitivity in radio because you're not seeing anything. Um, and the kind of imagination that has to be created through the script and the voice uh, takes a lot in the person that's doing it to bring that to the microphone. And when I hear the work my dad did and other people that um, um, did it in those days, it was really a uh, Andrew Allen, for instance, was, was an expert in his, and, and really a, a tutor with his people and students. And television, you can take another take and do another thing. And you know, Radio, there's no lighting to worry about. You're just there. You've got to make a sound. You've got to create that character. And having been brought up in radio, maybe I'm a little biased in that area. You prefer that? Um, I love sounds, yes. And uh, uh, there isn't much anymore that is real uh, in terms of radio which is a shame. Well, um, even in radio now, they no longer go through from the beginning, through the mm -hmm. middle, to the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. They take scenes on different days, mm -hmm. two or three days, oh. uh, all the scenes you're in with those actors, okay. and, then, and, and you really hmm. have no sense of the whole thing. The flow, yes, interesting, yeah. So I used to love that uh. radio. Well, and they, they were live to air, you see, so everybody was there. Yeah. And uh, it happened, and you had to make it work. And, uh, I think that was the fun of it, too, listening to, you know, the Jack Bennies and so forth, that uh, they were there, they were real, they were live, and uh, 
I think that came across. What have you done that you're most proud of? Um, I think the It's Happening shows, for one. The other one is the, uh, the Gemini work. That was nice to have that assignment uh, over a long period of time. I had never thought of entering any awards. I entered one or two and picked up this and that. I got a silver out of Texas. I even got uh, one from someplace for uh, original music track, which was kind of nice for it. But the Gemini was exciting, going through all of that and, and being... The Sky Dome was a Canadian Toronto location. It was something having to do with my business. Um, I got some little trophy for it for doing that in this business. And I think that's my biggest thrill. That was a big kick to get that. Sounds that was good. nice, yeah. What do you still want to do? What are you looking forward to? I would like to get back into programming at some point, and I haven't given up the seniors' idea. I think it's there. I think there's potential. More and more advertisers are now realizing and spending their money um, in diversifying on the various uh, channels that are available, including seniors. And uh, there's some good shows to be done. They're doing it in the U.S. They have been doing it for years. Uh, we were looking at starting a whole kind of vaudeville stage thing in Toronto, which is quite successful in the States, where people come in uh, on groups and tours to see it. Uh, that was part of our overall package for investment. And um, I was even looking at getting into some seniors' products. So we have a company that's, that's been formed, and um, uh, it'll happen someday, and just keep our eyes open. We were disappointed because we thought we were in a, a team thing here with, with Global. And... Uh, put our names on the line for it and help boost it, and then, uh, then they changed. Uh, so it will happen at some point in time, I know it will. Explain that a little more to me. You're talking about a seniors program. Is this five seniors or four seniors? Both. Or? Both. It would be a seniors channel, in a sense. Uh, oh, I see. So yeah. it would be 24 hours a day, things that are not just reruns of old movies, but, s but shows that would be specific for seniors, and in a sense, perhaps interactive now that uh, the net is there and people are using computers and so forth. But it would be entertaining and we were um, uh, working with a, a group, the uh, Elder Hostel group I guess, and uh, we were going to loan cameras to people so they could take them on their excursions and come back and talk about them. And that, so that would be a real personal type thing. And uh, a seniors uh, a game show not unlike Front Page Challenge which would be kind of fun. Um, oh, that's good which would be kind of interesting. Seniors would remember a lot of that's what we thought, and enjoy that. And uh, mm -hmm. um, so, would you have, would you have a, a how-to? I think so. I think so. And and a, a tip thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it would be really quite um, quite a broad scope, particular channel for uh, people. And um, I was learning all the buzz buzzwords about. Uh, seniors and a super senior is over 60 or something and a senior now is 50 which is um shakes up a lot of people at that point is that is that uh, where it starts now yeah 50? it's down to 50 as a senior that's a baby i know <laughs> well the baby boomers don't like it i'll tell you that and so super senior is sort of 60 plus i guess uh -huh. and uh but there's some lovely people there we wanted to go out and discover some new characters stars if you like um, a lot of people around that are retired and are, would be very good as hosts or guests or so forth and so on. And uh, just do the kinds of things perhaps that we did before, invent some new things, make it as interactive as possible. And uh, So it's there. It'll that happen. great. I wish you luck with it. It'll happen. Thank you. It sounds like something you Thank needed, you. you know. So well, we thought so, and this, this is about two and a half years ago, so uh -huh. uh, we're okay. still there. We've kept the company together at least, so. Good. We call it stage two, with a, a numeral oh, yeah. two. Stage two of your life, da da da, da and stage and so forth. So it's kind of cute. <laughs> and none of them want to get to stage three. That's right, for sure. <laughs> Tell hmm. me, what, what advice would you give to young people now, just starting out, who want to get into the business either in front of the camera mm -hmm. or back of it? Well, it's a tough haul, and it's going to take the tough to get there. If you take the career in front of the camera, um, you really should, with any career you're going to do, I believe, do your research. Uh, find out what's available. Find out if you're interested in, A, acting, then that route is through the stage and so forth. Um, if it's in the production business, 
I think there's a lot of kids being turned out these days from the school and there's no work. It used to be that you'd get a job up in Barrie, you'd work your way to Toronto, you'd try and get a job at um, City TV for next to nothing, and then when openings came, and I heard some years ago, this is only something I heard, that somebody had paid to work at City TV. The parents had paid for their son or daughter to work for a period of six months or so to become sort of an intern and when an opening came. So isn't that a switch? <laughs> that's not a bad idea. When you think of it, instead of an education well, or a schooling, school. that's right. And you're there, you get to know people, and obviously uh, openings come up from time to time, and then bingo, you're there. Well, I, I've always felt, that, certainly in stage acting, that you learn more from watching. Yes. Yeah. In a class, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you learn what to do, what not to do. And sort of hands-on, yeah. I used to stand in the wings forever. Uh. <laughs> Why is that going to last? Uh. Uh, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, uh, mm. so in other words, you are saying be prepared. But yes, yes, it. indeed. Uh, be prepared and, and um, do the research and talk to people uh, and make sure you're not spending three years at a school and getting out and finding that there's nothing there. And that's true of a lot of careers, I think, now, too. It's really changed. It'll be changing in the next few years. Unfortunately, if you have the showbiz bug in you, you're sunk. <laughs> you go that direction regardless. But it's, um, it, it's an interesting industry, and you have to look at the people that, that have been good in it and who have made it and uh, look at biographies and see what people did um, and, and look at the future. Maybe there's, there's broadcasting in the Internet that's a bit different because a lot of that still needs scripts and things to work there. It's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out in the next few years. And knock on a lot of doors. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to keep going. Yes. Well, Brian Purdy, ah. this has been a great pleasure. Oh, good. Thank you so much oh. for telling me about Not your at all. father, whom Not I knew all. Ah, and good. worked for. Oh, wonderful. Uh, good. But, you know, that was very, I didn't uh. know all about him. I didn't ah, okay. know all that. Mm -hmm. And I certainly didn't know all about you. And I'm mm. so glad you called me. Ah. I thank you for this. You're very welcome. Thank you. This is Sylvia Lennox for the Ben Lennox Astra Archives. Let's try and keep it steady for you there. You rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay, this is Ray Purdy. Uh, probably, um, I would guess, uh, in the 60s, 70s. See the sparkle in his eye? This is Ray Purdy, probably in the 30s. How old would he have been then? Uh, let's see, uh, probably in his late 20s. Okay. Mm, a bit like Leslie Howard. You have the same high forehead. Uh -huh. He lost his hair earlier than I did. No, no, so it, just, it looks extremely uh, intelligent. Oh, oh, that's <laughs> nice to know. A couple of shots here from the radio okay. days, which I'll... Just give you for a second. <coughs> I don't know whether you can capture all of this, but this was um, the group that had to do, I just want to make sure I've got the name right. Uh, Stars to be. <coughs> There's Lauren Green in this picture as well. He was the announcer of Stars to be. Catch that. Lauren Green was here, I think. That's Alice. Alice Hill was there too. She was okay, in that yeah. series, yeah. And she was, I think she's in here someplace. Anyway, that's Stars to Be. And Lauren Green is third from the left. Mm -hmm. Catch this corner, I remember that. Remember that column? Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. But that was in the star or something. And, uh,. Well, you can catch this, but it's a nice little thing of the radio days showing the signs which floor managers end up using on TV. Just do a tilt down, perhaps. Yeah, okay, and that just shows behind the glass, instructing actors to slow down, speed up, uh, cut, all of the things you can't say out loud, which. Eventually, <laughs> which eventually floor managers had to memorize to do to people that were on camera. Okay, 
be stretch. <laughs> Don't be speed up because you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and all and over. Okay. Okay. <coughs> to get these two are with Monty Hall or the top one is Monty Hall and my dad find your fortune and then down below <coughs> it's with uh, Mark Kenny and Norma Locke because they did the music back in those days so <coughs> do the top picture first perhaps <coughs> that's Ray Purdy goofing around with Monty Hall on a radio program called find your fortune they were co MCs on that program. It was in the theater at CFRB, I'm sure. Okay, how about the other one? Okay, good. Now this is the <coughs> whole group from Find Your Fortune. And I just work in the wrong Okay. That's another group shot of Find Your Fortune with uh, Mark Kenny on the left and Norma Locke, his wife, that were musical songs. Okay. Okay, I think that's, let me just check. They were nice to have as, say, radio stuff. Uh, and this bottom one is Treasure Trail. That came from CFRB Studio. Co-hosted with Alan Savage. I mentioned that in the interview. You see Treasure Trail logo behind it. That was for the radio Howard audience. Howard went on to become a producer. Yes, and he worked for an agency. I can't remember which one advertising agency at some I point, too. I can't remember either, but I know I did a lot of work for Did Alan. you? Yeah, he's a very nice man. I remember as a youngster, because my dad and he were very good friends, and kids used to play around together. So that's Alan Savage on the right, Ray Purdy on the left. Good. Treasure Trail, co-hosting. Good. And uh, sink. Let me catch the ones that relate to specific programs. As I say, this is mainly radio, so I didn't get into bringing any of the pictures with Roy Thompson or anything like that. Letters from Ernie Bushnell and Harry Sedgwick. Just one more that you might want to use in the radio days. We're talking about the show Out of the Night. So that was a shot of him at the microphone. That's kind of a nice one when he was doing that show at CFRB. Good. Thank okay. You very much. Thank you. I thank you again. Ah. Okay.